Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Updates, the 4th of October. As always, we have the chapters, so you can jump to any particular update you care about the most. New videos this week, so I dived into how I can use API management with Generative AI. I did a deeper dive on APIM a few weeks ago, and I touched on how you could use it with Generative AI, but in this video I go through more specific features and even demonstrate some of the really cool capabilities like the semantic caching. Then I also did a video on the ability now to, as a manager, I can request an access package from entitlement management on behalf of my direct reports. If I had new joiners who weren't quite up to speed on how to use these kind of features, I can go and request it for them and they can just get up and running that much faster. So I go through that capability. On to what's new on the compute side. So we have the NM ADS MA35D series virtual machines in preview. This is kind of a strange naming and it reflects this is really the first Azure VM SKU that use specialized hardware, specifically this ASIC. So we have this application specific integrated circuit, which is a video processing unit, has eight gigabytes of memory and it's this Exalink MA35D Supernova. Think of it as a high performance media accelerator card. So you get 16 uh, virtual CPUs, 32 gigabytes of RAM, 76 gigabytes of temporary storage, four gigabits per second of network bandwidth. So it's really optimized for batch and real time video transcoding type workloads. So if I need higher throughput, lower latency, but a lower total cost of ownership where I had this specialized type of workload, this will be a really good skew to leverage. We also have the NVADS V10 V5 series virtual machines. So these are AMD uh, Radeon V710 GPUs. So it's got GPU hardware in addition to AMD Epic CPUs. And I have five options because we can actually divide up the GPU. So it ranges from a sixth of a GPU and for each sixth of a GPU, you get four Gibby bytes of frame buffer all the way up to the entire GPU. So you get 24 Gibby bytes of frame buffer. And there's no other GPU licensing required. So here, if I had maybe very uh, highly interactive gaming type experiences in the cloud, so I could render those complex graphics, Maybe I have high graphical requirements for virtual desktops hosted in the cloud. Even small to medium AI machine learning inference workloads like a small language model, uh, this would be a really good fit. Okay, let me get into uh, promotion mode. You can save 15% in addition to your existing one year Azure Reserve VM instances for this latest Linux VM limited period time offer. This means you could save up to 56% compared to running an Azure VM on a pay-as-you-go basis. This offer is available exclusively between October 1st, 2024 and March 31st, 2025. To take advantage of this promotional offer, purchase a one-year Azure reserved VM instance for a qualified VM SKU and region today. <sighs> but there you go. Uh, you can get a cheaper reserved instance uh, for a limited time offer. I had to do that. Uh, Azure Spring Apps uh, retirement has been announced end of March 2028. So obviously this is an interesting one. This was a managed service jointly created with Microsoft and VMware, now part of Broadcom. And there's really two stages to this retirement. So September 30th, 2024, the standard consumption and dedicated plans enter a six month sunset period. All right, as of now, you have a six month sunset period to a Tire end of March 2025. But then in mid March 2025, all of the other Spring Apps plans, so basic standard enterprise, enter a three year sunset period. Now, the recommendation is to move to Azure Container Apps. Um, if you actually look at what's been happening to Azure Container Apps recently, they have added a whole bunch of managed Spring components as part of Azure Container Apps. Obviously, they were preparing to be able to migrate the Azure Spring Apps workloads over to Azure Container Apps. There is a full retirement guide. So if we go and quickly look at that, it does go through the details. It does also talk about other options you could have. It talks about that timeline I just mentioned. 
the recommendation to move to Azure Container Apps as that primary, but also potentially um, there are other options you could consider moving to. It, it walks through the possible other options. We talk about App Service, AKS potentially, uh, Tanzu, um, et cetera. And yeah, so I'll link that migration guide in the description of the video if you wanna go and dive in and understand uh, the more details about that. On the networking side, so Azure Virtual Network Manager, remember we use this for things like applying policies to control traffic so we can apply before NSGs. We can use it to essentially manage the peering and connectivity relationships between maybe spokes, between a full mesh, hub and spoke, et cetera. Well, now it has IPAM, IP Address Management. This works for both IPv4 and IPv6. And it addresses the challenge we tend to have as we get bigger environments of how do I ensure I don't have overlapping IP ranges on my VNets, but also between my VNets in Azure and on-premises, uh, other clouds. So it's gonna let me centrally manage the IP address space, allocate IP address space, understand how I've allocated my IP address space, and even see what is the current allocation usage of the IPs uh, from those IP spaces. Moving on. So this is in preview and it's only in the API and the CLI at time of recording, but it lets me do a subnet level peering. Ordinarily, we peer entire virtual networks. So the entire address space of each of those virtual networks becomes advertised to all of the different NICs. So the effective route table of the NICs in those peered VNets will show the entire address space of the other virtual network. What this lets me do is at the time of creating the peering, I can say peer complete VNet to false, then actually specify the specific subnets I want both for the remote VNet, remote subnet names, and for my local VNet, local subnet names. And then the routes will only be programmed into the NICs, the effective routes for the subnets we have named. So it lets you have a little bit more control over that. And then the Express Route Guided Experience has gone GA. One of the big elements here is about setting the resiliency for your Express Route connections. And we think about maximum, high, and standard. So maximum would be I have two completely different circuits in two completely different meet me those peering locations in completely different cities. I want them a big distance apart. And remember, each of those circuits has an active-active connection. So that gives me really good resiliency from an entire metro city level area having some natural disaster, for example. When I use high, it uses the new express route metro connectivity where those two active active connections, they're in the same city at the edge location, but they go to two different facilities. So what this gives you resilience from is if a building had a problem. I remember there was the issue, I think around Christmas, Chicago, one of the meet me's, they had a cooling issue. And so both the active active connections for your circuit were in the same building and they were both down. So what the Metro lets you do, and I've done a whole video about this, is actually go to two different meet me's, two different peering edge locations in the same city. So I get resilience from a building level failure, kind of like AZs with regions. And then the standard is just, hey, you have the active active for your circuits going to the same meet me. So it will guide you through configuring those things. On the database side, so SAP HANA Backup now has a reduced protected instance fee. So this uses a combination of disk and HANA snapshots. And really the goal here is to deliver a better, lower cost. So it makes it easier for enterprises to protect their critical data and not have to compromise on the quality of that protection because of cost. Uh, so a, a HANA streaming backup for Easter S2, for example, would be $80 per instance. And you can go and see all the details in the announcements. And then Microsoft Fabric now has a Terraform provider. So if I think infrastructure as code, I wanna deploy, manage, govern my Microsoft Fabric environment and I'm using Terraform. Remember Terraform works across different providers, whereas something like Bicep or the JSON templates is just Azure. If I'm using Terraform, well now those providers for Azure has Microsoft Fabric support. So I can use infrastructure as code from Terraform. On the miscellaneous, so the Azure Business Continuity Center's gone GA. So think of this as that streamlined centralized management 
for all things backup and disaster recovery across Azure and your hybrid environments. So Azure Backup, Azure Site Recovery, and it does replace the Azure Backup Center. In fact, I think even now the Azure Backup Center is kind of hidden from you. You can still get there from the Azure Business Continuity Center. I mean, you go to help, there's a little link to the old Azure Backup Center. There's no costs involved for this solution. It's really there to help you centrally manage the various services you're leveraging for your backup and for your DR. For Azure Monitor Log Alerts, so I'm running queries against my Azure Monitor Log workspaces. From that, I can trigger alerts. From the alerts, I can trigger action groups, which can include different things. One of those is sending an email. And there was a common schema-based version that had certain data in it. But what they've done is they've now got a new template that's more informative, more user-friendly with the data it's gonna show you. I can still use the old common schema-based version if I want to, but the idea now is it's a much uh, more informative, useful template. The Azure Diagnostic Extension retires uh, end of March, 2026. Obviously the Azure Diagnostics Extension along with the old Log Analytics Agent, along with the Telegraph Extension were all replaced with the Azure Monitor Agent. So the goal here is both Windows and Linux, if you're using the Azure Diagnostic Extension, you wanna be moving over to the Azure Monitor Agent, which replaces it. And then Azure AI Studio. So it has a whole bunch of risk and safety capabilities. When you think content safety, when you think responsible AI, which is huge with generative AI because it's non-deterministic. I don't always know what the output's gonna be. They've added a series of additional capabilities. So one of them is indirect prompt injection attacks. So you think cross-domain, uh, XPIA, and this is where I poison some grounding data source. It could be, for example, a public website, which the model then trains on, and I can inject basically an attack. So, hey, the generative AI, when it sees certain signals may, as part of its output, show me certain bits of data, maybe uses some keyword that to the bad actor, and that gives me information. So now I can simulate this attack, and then I could evaluate how my application and my model deployment responds. Maybe I'd use something like a prompt shield or change my prompt, whatever, if I find that's an issue. It also has protection material for text. So again, think models are trained on content, huge amounts of content. Well, potentially my response could include some protected content, which would then be an infringement issue for my application, my company. So what this does, it performs an evaluation. And then if you find based on that evaluation, it's a risk, you could then use something like protected material detection in Azure AI content safety. I could adjust the system message again, different mitigations, but it helps me assess what is my actual real risk that I'm gonna go and spit out protected material. It also has math-based metrics to assess the quality of my text-based output. So expected output, my precision, my recall, my grammatical excellence, mine would be terrible. And so I can evaluate the metrics and then again, maybe make changes. And finally, there is now a synthetic data generator and simulator for non-adversarial attacks. Now there's already a simulator for red teaming when I'm trying to actually attack. But for non-adversarial, just general interactions, I may lack quality data. So this will actually help me generate uh, data around different personas to evaluate uh, how my model actually responds. So some nice uh, sets of capabilities there. And that was it. Uh, as always, I hope that was useful. Until next video, take care.